Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yusuf al baghir and I'm a journalist. And for the last year, I've been covering the revolution in Sudan. And for the first five months of my coverage, I was not allowed to call it a revolution. It was a protest movement, it was dissidents, it was civil unrest, but not a revolution. So, in retrospect, I've been asking myself, what makes a revolution in popular narrative terms, and when do the events on the ground transcend narrative building and entrench themselves and allow themselves to have a revolutionary title? Is it a single event? Is it the overthrowing of a despot, a re regime change? Or is it a shift in popular consciousness? And what I've found is that it's both, and what connects them are the images. So an event happens, landmark events that symbolize change, that spur on calls for change, social reform, are captured as images and are shared and disseminated in a way that transcends local barriers. And then what you get is a revolution. So in the case of Sudan, mobile phones Camera phones were the enemy of dictatorship, an antidote to press censorship and means for civilians to capture every moment of the movement and the brutal reaction of the state. In Sudan, the economy had spiraled following the secession of the North and the South, and the corruption of Omar al-Bashir and his allies was too brazen to hide. Photos of day-long lines for fuel, bread, cash were disseminated across the diaspora, and everyone was furious. And what happened is that people chose that they would rather die calling for change than from starvation. There's a lot of debate about the exact start dates of the protests, but for me, there was a very clear moment where everything changed. December 19th, an anti-regime protest took place in Abbara, a town 200 kilometers northeast of Khartoum, historically known as a workers' town. Pro-democracy marchers got to the headquarters of the ruling party of Omar al-Bashir's NCP party, and they set it ablaze. And what happened after that, and excuse the pun, is that the sparks of dissidents around the country became a fire of protests. And then 25th of December, a march in central Khartoum, right in the heart of the city, marked the standoff between the people and the military state and became what many have called one of the greatest nonviolent mass movements of our generation. Then, protests kicked off in Algeria, and civilians held up signs to show their solidarity with Sudan. It was a domino effect, but what we realized is that it wasn't linear. There was a feedback system. So when Algerians took to the streets in their capital city in hundreds of thousands, what that did was spur on the movement in Sudan just when it started to stagnate. So people in Sudan planned a millions march. And so they marched to the military compound where the president was staying for his safety, and they protested, and they formed a sit-in camp. So it was a sit-in site, and they didn't move. And then two days later, after chanting, reciting poetry, everyone just gathering around, calling for freedom, peace, and equality, and recording it all on their mobile phones, this happened. You saw it earlier, but you, you will probably have seen it before. And that was the moment that Sudan's protest movement stopped being called unrest, all these euphemisms for a revolution, and started to be called a real revolution. And the president was still in power. But the global pressure mounted after Sudan's revolution became viral, and the president was ousted by his former allies. But the people stayed put. And this is, again, the feedback system, where they saw from Egypt, from the 2011 Egyptian revolution, that the military state was deeper than just one man, than just one person. So they stayed, and the chance went from being, we want a revolution, to the revolution has only just begun. And they stopped targeting an individual, started targeting the whole system. And nearly two months later, that camp, which was a stronghold for democracy, was brutally massacred. More than 100 civilians were killed, dozens of women and men raped, and I won't post any, show any images of that because it was incredibly triggering for a lot of people. But <laughs> and then that day, the government switched off the internet. At a time where the economy was already in complete disarray, that cost the government more than $1 billion. Why would they do that? 
They knew the power of dissemination, they knew the power of the internet, and they knew that global pressure would keep mounting if these images continue to get out. And again, the dissemination, WhatsApp, Facebook, these were ways that a lot of people get their information nowadays, more than CNN, more than Sky News, more than BBC. People look to their phones. But the movement transformed and something incredible happened. It went blue. A lot of you may have seen this on social media. This shade of blue was the favorite color of one of the protesters, Mohammed Matar, who was killed during the massacre disper dispersal. And that shade of blue came to represent all the people who had died during the revolution in Sudan, calling for freedom, calling for equality, calling for peace. So in the absence of images coming out of Sudan during internet blackout, an other image was used to sear that into public consciousness. June 30th, in the midst of an internet blackout, Sudan's revolution went analog. People went around to neighborhoods, they did face-to-face -face mobilization, they gave out leaflets, they did it the old school way. And it worked. And they took to the streets more than they did even the first Millions March, more than they did when President Bashir was still in power. They went out and they showed the government that they didn't need social media, they didn't need the internet. That they would continue to call for a civilian rule in the face of a deep military state. And weeks later, a power sharing agreement was signed between the military and civilian opposition. And we are now in the process of a transition. Whether or not that will prove to bring about the change that people want is another thing, but real change happened. And that was through the power of imagery. And the imagery dictated the narrative, as opposed to mainstream media dictating what people could categorize things as. And this is not just happening in Sudan, as you know. It's been mentioned a lot today, but everyone knows that there is a global shift happening. This is just the countries that have been protesting over the last year. And these are pronounced anti-establishment protests. Around 35 countries are represented in this map, but social media will tell you that there are much more. And everyone seems to be calling for similar things. You know, it's not just specific domestic needs. It's ideals, you know, freedom, peace, equality. These are big things, and they're things that are shared across the world. So when images are disseminated, people feel them. And so when I say some of the names on this map, Chile, Venezuela, Iraq, Lebanon, Algeria, Sudan, Egypt, an image might come to mind, and it's images that you've seen online. And so my point today is that images are what we use to navigate things happening in places that we don't know and we've never been in. And what it does is it shows that revolutions in all these different countries have so much in common. You've got the full spectrum of humanity, you've got the worst of humankind with the crackdowns and the brutality and the rape and the torture. And you've got the very best, the perseverance, the courage, the strength. And these are all universal themes. Thank you.